Hello and welcome to Crime Watch Daily Updates. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. Bookstores are a place to get transported to another world to escape the noise of everyday life and end up somewhere new. For one bookseller in Salt Lake City, Utah, however, the future chapters of her life were cut short when she was assaulted and killed in her own store. Sherry Black and her husband, Earl, owned a bookstore called B&W Supply Billiards and Books. Sherry dealt with the books while Earl restored pool tables in their store right next to their home. On November 30th of 2010, Earl went back to B&W and discovered that his wife had been beaten and stabbed in the store. Little seemed to be out of place except for an Armani belt. The killer left behind bloody fingerprints, but investigators could not find a match to those prints. Detectives cleared Earl and their family of suspicion. Then almost exactly a decade after Sherry's violent killing, detectives in Salt Lake arrested 29-year-old Adam DeBurro on October of 2020. Investigators ultimately got a break in the case after sending DNA to a lab and scientists were able to create a profile of what the suspect probably looked like. And that is how they got to Adam. In October of 2021, he pleaded guilty to aggravated murder and was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Let's look back at the case of a well-known local businesswoman whose family finally got justice after her murder a decade later. In a tiny bookstore off a busy highway, behind the stacks of dusty novels and dog-eared hymnals, unthinkable horror. Here mother was taken from you. It was just so vicious and senseless. What happened behind the counter of this quaint country bookshop? A random crime or cruel and bloodthirsty payback? Was there anyone who didn't like Sherry? There was at least one. Now, everyone in my hometown is asking, was the high price of these rare books paid in cold blood? Salt Lake City, headquarters of the Mormon religion. Its histories and registries written in the hundred-year-old pages of books. Pages that can be worth a fortune. Like how much? A a nice book of Mormon is a hundred thousand dollar book. Sherry Black lived here and loved books too. A voracious reader since an early age. My mom had so many books. Her daughter Heidi Miller says Sherry never read a book she didn't love. I mean, was that always a passion? She knew what she was doing. She knew where everything was, and she she had a knack for it. She was amazing. Heidi married into wealth. Her husband, Greg Miller, is the owner of the NBA team, Utah Jazz. But Greg says his in-laws, Sherry and Earl, preferred a simpler life. They didn't have a lot of money, her and Earl, but they really worked hard to make the most of what they had. Later in their life together, Sherry and Earl fulfill a dream, opening a quirky little store along this busy stretch of eight-lane highway. The bookstore is adjacent to Sherry Black's house. It looks kind of like a little log cabin almost. They call it B&W Billiards and Books, where Earl restores old pool tables and Sherry buys and sells rare books. The most valuable ones, artifacts of her Mormon faith. It's a small bookstore, it's a, a niche bookstore, mostly for L- mostly LDS books, which was Sherry Black's passion. And this quaint religious bookstore is the last place you'd expect anything bad to happen. That would change early one morning when Sherry's family learns the devil paid a visit to her little log cabin. I called her cell phone and I called her home and nobody would answer and it was just so, so strange. I just had this really weird feeling. Sherry's husband Earl returns to the shop in the early afternoon. He had just shown back up to the bookstore to uh, unload some items. Earl winds his way through Sherry's stacks of books, calling her name. The eerie silence, nothing out of the ordinary for the quiet little store. When you initially walked in, you would have not even known anything was amiss until you started looking closer. When Earl does look closer, back in the stockroom, he stumbles upon absolute horror. 
911. What is the address of the emergency? Oh, my wife's been murdered. It's Sherry lying in a pool of blood. Is she awake? No, she's dead. Okay, is she breathing at all? No, she's dead. <laughs> uh, I can't. I can't handle this. It's a sight so graphic and terrifying, it stuns even veteran detective Joe Sotera. What was your reaction when you saw Sherry? Um, I actually, I mean, I've been doing this for quite a while, and, and this was probably one of the most brutal um, scenes I've seen. How was she killed? She was beaten and stabbed, and it was a, a violent, brutal scene. Just out of a horror, horror story. Heidi's previous weird feeling comes shockingly real when Earl calls, his voice racked with pain and confusion. My dad called and said, somebody's killed your mom. And I just, it didn't make any sense. He just said, you need to get here quick. Heidi races across town, her mind still reeling. It was just so vicious and, I don't know, senseless. Did it feel like to you that this was someone who knew what they were doing, who went in with a purpose? This was not a well-planned, well-organized crime. There's cash still in the register, and the rest of the shop appears undisturbed. She kept the most valuable books in a safe, and it, and it appears that they were all accounted for. But if not a robbery, then why? As you came in and assess the crime scene, did you find any evidence or clues as to who might have done this? Well, in this particular case, there's a lot of evidence. Including the killer's fingerprints, trails of his blood, and an item that's definitely out of place in this vintage religious bookstore, a trendy Armani exchange belt. We believe it came from the suspect. Why was it there? We don't believe it was actually used in the attack, but we believe maybe he was planning on using it in the attack. But why would anyone attack the mild-mannered owner of a bookshop? All the time we've been there, I was uh, very surprised that we'd never been robbed or you know, any problems that way. In this interview, recorded shortly after Sherry's murder, her husband Earl says he not only has to bury his wife, but dismantle the bookstore she loved so much. I don't know, we're not going to leave the store open. We do plan on selling the books, but... Uh, we're going to make her proud. We're not just going to... We're not just going to get we'll rid of her. We'll never know what she knew, but we can try. And Earl's heartbreaking grief. <laughs> proving to investigators he had nothing to do with Sherry's murder. We've cleared all the family. We've, we've looked at them extensively, and you have to in an investigation like that. Her friends, close friends and family, have no idea who did this. Neither do police. The fingerprints, blood, nothing matches anything in police records. There have been no DNA matches or anything? No. But was there a dark omen of the crime? To your knowledge, was there ever anyone that seemed questionable or a little on the shady side? I mean, occasionally she would get people like that. Um, not a lot. Turns out Sherry did have a brief history with a suspicious customer. Does he hold the key to her brutal murder? Why would you think somebody was going to come murder you for a book? A tale of terror you hope to only read about in crime novels. Sherry Black, brutally murdered in the stockroom of her antique bookstore. I'm just out of a horror story. Her killer, unknown. Police, stumped. And he just isn't on the radar yet at this point. Sherry's killer left behind blood and clear fingerprints, but they don't match anyone on the books. How many people have you interviewed about this case over the years? Hundreds. Also at the scene, a knock-off Armani exchange belt. Its origin, unknown. There was a sticker on the back of the belt, the number's 323. We were never able to confirm what that actually meant. Sherry was beaten and stabbed here. B&W Billiards and Books, an unassuming shop she owned with her husband, Earl. So this is the crime scene? You just never know it was, was here unless you really knew about it. Yeah. 
What could the killer want that forced Sherry to pay with her life? The answer could be right here on the shelves. The rare Mormon books can be worth an extraordinary amount of money. Ken Sanders runs a vintage bookstore much like Sherry's. It's big business in Salt Lake City headquarters of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, where parishioners will pay top dollar for a printed piece of history. Book of Commandments is worth a million dollars plus. A million dollars plus. People will kill for a heck of a lot less than that. With that kind of cash on the line, a dangerous clientele is never far away. When you learn that this poor woman has been brutally murdered, it's like, it, it's beyond comprehension. Who, who would do that? It has everybody wondering, was Sherry's killer someone she dealt with before? Do you think that her murder had any connection to the rare books that she dealt with? At the time, there was a criminal gang of men allegedly stole some extraordinarily rare books. And these books inadvertently were purchased by Sherry Black, and she sold a few of them before it came out that they were stolen and had to be returned. That seller, Lauren Nilsen, and he's no Mormon missionary. His father has several rare books and rare items from Mormon history, so it wouldn't be that much of a surprise for some bad guy to take advantage of her. And Sherry helped bring him down. She was cooperative with law enforcement in prosecuting that individual. Was Sherry's murder related? Was she the victim of a brutal payback? It's the best lead Detective Joe Sutera has, but hopes of a quick resolution are dashed once again. The Nielsen connection is a dead end. It was a link to Sherry, so of course we looked into that, and he's not the suspect. None of that evidence, blood, handprints, that unique trendy belt, could put a face to the data. Until now. Take a good look at this face, not a photograph, but a digital reconstruction. The heritage is 46% Western Africa and 34% European. Investigators put the killer's blood work through the process of phenotyping, generating a mugshot from mere strands of DNA from age 25 to 38 to 52 years. This particular person, 25 years of age, and then the uh, second poster is one of somebody of 52 years of age. Detective Ben Pender is picking up the case where Joe Zutera left off, re-examining interviews and evidence and getting the killer's digital mugshot out in the public eye. I do believe somebody saw something. Even if it's not something that's going to solve the case, it allows us to progress the case and continue to progress this case, I mean, because it is ongoing. And any progress could help a grieving family feel whole again. This is a case that's never going to go away. It's not going to be put on the shelf until we have some resolution. Sherry's daughter Heidi and son-in-law Greg Miller aren't letting Sherry's killer off the hook either, bumping the reward to $250,000 for information that nabs the killer. You guys have really done just about as much as anyone could possibly do. We have been blessed with some resources that many families don't have, and we're fortunate that we've been in a position where we can do some of that. And the Millers have something else something that certainly helped me stay strong during my own ordeal of kidnapping and captivity, even when all seemed lost, hope. My parents never gave up on me. How do you keep going forward without giving up even though the odds don't really feel like they're in your favor that much? I feel like as long as I know that we're doing everything that we can, there's hope. I can never give up hope.